Hello everyone, this is I Am Mark III, and welcome to the world of Endless Legend. This is a what you're doing video, I got asked the question, this is what I was doing, and he wanted to see very much what this was about, so here we go. Right now we are focused on the wondrous city of Ganli, it is the capital of my empire, and it's not very impressive. I must be honest about that. I mean, the model does look good, but I've not grown it really. It's only four population, I've not expanded it at all. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Endless Legend is produced by Iceberg Interactive, I believe it is. And is very similar in name to their game Endless Space. As it should be, because they do actually share a lot of mechanics. They have the same kinds of resources in it, namely, um, well, let's have a look. Let's bring up the city screen first. Yeah, they've got uh, food, production, science, dust. But they also have a fifth one here called influence. So that is a different one. And they also call them all fids. And they have the same kind of basic pattern. But that is really where the similarities stop. Endless Legend is a 4X game, very much inspired by the Civilization franchise as most games of this type are. Hex-based, turn-based, and that is why I can take so long with such a rambling introduction. But, um, to be honest, it is set in a fantasy world, but it's also a lot deeper in terms of lore and variety than Civilization is. I've also got to put that out there. Because we've got more terrain types, I've got cold grasslands here, I've got um, snowy fields, They've got cliffs up here that you can't move across, you just have to move around it. We've got arid lands over here, we've got forests over here, we've got seas. And, yeah, pretty much all that. But, where games from these guys actually shine is, as I said, really the lore. Because let's, let's start with the resources, Lord. This is a black dust place. A form of naturally occurring deposit, these springs of gold and black provide a source of never-ending fuel. And really this thing produces extra science and extra dust. So that's a bonus point. A... well, just a plain resource really. Though they're called anomalies in this one. These generic ones, like the black dust, they just produce extra stuff. Here's another one. Mitochondria, this is a luxury resource because it no it's, no, it's not. This is still actually a normal resource, but it's one of the ones that actually produces happiness as well, to make your city happier. So it can expand further, and generally won't be a real pain for you. And again, it produces different things. Mitochondria. The gaping moors of these leathery growths are reminiscent of uh, benthic horrors, yet seductive music emanates from their mouths, and their flesh makes a pungent bread. So yeah, that's the kind of food. No wonder it produces happiness, even though my people don't eat food. <laughs> yeah, that's fun, isn't it? Um, there's also strategic resources. I'm not actually mining any of them at the moment, but here's one of them. Titanium deposit, which produces just titanium, really, if you build a mine on it. And there's another one around somewhere, which is... Here we go, glass steel. I'm currently building an extractor on that, so that's why there's a structure under construction on it. But um, there's also luxury resources. I don't actually have any of those going either. Yeah, this is nice. This is the overall map, which you can zoom out on. And that's... there's one. Strategic resource? No. Luxury resource. Spice deposit. Grind down roots, fruits or leaves of certain fragrant plants into pungent aromatic powders can transform city food stocks. Where once vulnerable to rot, many foods when treated can be preserved for several moons. Which has a booster effect on it as well. Luxury resources, if you build up enough of them in a stockpile, then you can activate a booster, which is a limited time bonus to your empire. In this case, it increases food production on my cities, which is useless for my race, but it also provides a bit of extra happiness as well, which I can still use. Now, I've been saying that um, food is useless for my race, and that is actually true. I'm playing as a faction called the Broken Lords, and they have absolutely zero use for food at all. They can't actually gather it. That's why it says here, zero. Plus four from the city hall, but minus four from a faction trait called Appetite for Dust. 
which basically means any food bonus is completely cancelled out. So places like this one here, which is a... Um, well, that, I can't check that because there's an, an army on it. Yeah, look, here we go. There's got to be some... Yeah, grasslands here. Plus one from terrain with plains, plus one from cold grassland, minus two from appetite for dust. So yeah, I can't gather any food. And I don't need any food. Because these guys actually use dust as their primary resource. They get a small bonus of gathering it. But they can use it to just plain buy population every time they stop high enough. And that's how they grow their cities. They just buy the people. Which is rather nice, to be honest. There are entire groups of... Um, well, there's entirely different sets of units as well. Like, these guys are basically just walking, ancient, robot-type people. And they're trying to convert everyone to their belief that everything is pointless, or something like that. I'm not really familiar with their law. But then we've also got... Um, who else have we got? That's my diplomacy screen. That's the market. There we go. Yeah, we've got um, two of those around against me. And you see that these are their leaders. These four-armed, ancient, doll-type things. And then we've got these dragons. Just look at that. Well, mighty and majestic, but yeah. It's a um, mythological setting, so you get all sorts of like that. I'm only fam really familiar with the Dust Lords and another one called the Necrophages, which are basically... We are... Mutant beasts, ravenous, and we want to eat the entire world kind of deal. They are actually stuck in permanent war with everyone. But um, they are really good at producing food from captured cities and from killing other enemy units, so stuff like that. So yeah, even the uh, main main races do get a lot of variety and different traits on them. Things like that. I mean, um, necrophages and broken lords are the two I'm familiar with the most. But you've also got minor races around as well, which are, again, into the overview map. Here we go. Minor villages, minor village, different groups. Like, I'm currently working to capture the Delvers. Skilled, at, skilled with digging and mining, little is seen from Delver villages other than portals that lead into the earth. Beneath these simple portals, however, entire underground cities are likely to exist. So, basically, they're a kind of dwarf. But, yeah... There's also other guys around. These um, these mini factions here, they don't have much. They've just got this little backstory flavor text. But they also provide different bonuses as well. Like Jotas here. Closer to animals than civilized, reasoning beings. The villages of the Jotas reflect this rude and simple lifestyle of, of their inhabitants. How very nice of them. And then there's these guys over here. Which has got this nice little army, which I'm going to have to deal with soon. And they are... The Seraton. No, wait, that's not right. What are, what are those? Ursus. Ursus? What? Aren't they the next... Yeah, the, yeah, they're the next province over. <laughs> Here we go. Ursus. A simple people who migrate for reasons unknown. Ursus will construct villages from local materials, then suddenly leave them empty and move on. So, yeah. They're a kind of ogre species. And I'm going to have to deal with them, because they've wandered into my territory. I don't want them there. But yeah. Let's move on to the maps. Unlike in um, Civilization, you don't get to put cities down wherever you like. The map is randomly generated, and it generates into these selected provinces, all of which get named, and stuff like that. And a single province, you can only build one city in it. Only the one. So you've got to choose where you want to put it to get the most out of the um, actual place itself. Like, I, since my race is focused on dust, I've mostly gone after dust-rich spots, or with some nice resources around there. I mean, if I put a city up here, for example, it wouldn't be very much use to me at all. So I put it down here in this province instead. And in this place, I'm going to try and found a city right here, in this nice patch of dust-rich um, dust fields, and right next to this tree of life. If that roving enemy army will actually let me, because um, you start off Cold War status with everyone. So, I've got this unescorted settler here, and they are quite likely to attack it and generally ruin my day in that regard while I try to take over this entire province. <laughs> so, you know. But once you've got a province, then you can knock over all of the um, indigenous villages. You've got to attack them, take them out, because otherwise they remain neutral, and they will occasionally spawn these roving armies, which can be a problem. But once you've got them, you can actually assimilate them into your empire. 
you can only assimilate one to start, but you can get extra slots to assimilate more. And they give a bonus based on how many villages you've got of their particular race. Like this one is plus 5% to food income per village you've got, which is doesn't mean just has to be in your t territory. You've got to destroy the village and then rebuild it. And then you've got the bonus. But these guys are useless to me because it's plus 5% food. I don't use food at all. These guys are nice. Plus 5% defense. Which um, I do want defense. But the Delvers, who I went out of my way to get territory with, are plus 5% to dust income. Since I rely on dust so much, that's the one I want. So I'm just going to assimilate those. And there we go. I've got plus 5% bonus. Or I would if I'd actually built a village. I haven't built a village, so I don't get that just yet. I've got to rebuild that thing first. That smoking hole in the ground there. <laughs> so yeah, I think you can see where this is going. You've got the, your usual 4x stuff. You've got um, researches. Once you research enough in the first tier, it moves on to the second tier. And so on and so on and so on and so forth. All the way up to the sixth tier, which is the... Basically just the bonuses and gets counted towards specific the scientific victories and things like that. You can also do, um, there's a expansion victory, a domination victory, and I don't know what else. I know of those three for sure. But um, something else you do get that I quite like is quests. Quite unusual in a game of this type. You get, um, you get side quests every now and then, which can be revealed in exp exploring ruins which are these things here unfortunately I've explored all the ones near me so oh, this one I haven't explored just down there as you can see it gets this little glowy effect around it if you've not explored it and these can give you nothing or they can give you bonuses like a bit of extra dust or an extra resource or something like that and generally it's really good because they also give you experience for your units moving into them for the first time and you don't you can also um, explore any that you've not come across before. It's not on a first-come, first-served basis, as far as I can tell. So everyone can explore every ruin on the map. Though there might be a bonus for getting there first, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Um, what was I touching on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Influence. That's something else in the diplomacy. You can't actually go around saying hello I want to be your best bud give me these resources all that kind of thing if you go into a diplomacy with other races because you need influence like like I used influence to actually assimilate that um, minor race there you need influence to actually conduct diplomacy so I can go and talk to these guys and look see warning them will cost me eight influence that's okay I've got plus six at the moment but uh, you really don't get that much production overall until you start expanding and growing, or unless you focus on it and put all your people into it. But yeah, close borders, I need 80 influence to try and get that. Or I declare war, I need 56 influence to try and do that. So you can't even start attacking people unless you've got the influence to do it. And that's because you're trying to influence your entire empire into going along with this. So if you can't get your empire to go along with it, it's just empty, empty words really. You, you can't back any of it up. See, city screen, here we go. But yeah, basically you've got all the different stuff. You can upgrade structures to give you different benefits. You can produce um, resource extractors. You've got to actually research technology to unlock them. And as you research deeper into the game, you do get more resource types popping up as well, which you then need to build extractors on. And things like that. So that is really good. You can also expand it. You also, by taking over minor villages, you get access to some of their units as well. Like, I've got access to um, dredges, and that's because I've got an assimilated village of that type. I don't normally have access to them, but each one has their own unique attributes and things like that. So, to expand your range of unit types, you'd need to actually start taking over these minor villages, and it can give you some really strange stuff. But each faction has, like, three home units kind of thing. Units of their own type, which they can unlock through the research, and stuff like that. Something else you've got is heroes. These are your city managers and army managers. Like I've got a hero here at the moment. And you can equip them with different gear to increase their effectiveness. They get different abilities. And as they get experience, they level up through these skill trees, giving them various focuses. I normally go for a roaming around type of hero, which is common. 
mostly. But this game I've been trying to focus on dust, so I've been going to the faction effects instead. So I've got bonuses to dust and stuff like that. And up here they can get really powerful, like plus 15% per level of this to dust production in the city. So that's really useful, that. But at the moment it seems to just be per person working on dust kind of thing. Oh yeah, that's right. Cities. I mentioned moving workers around before. Your population appears up here and you can focus them into different areas. You can get them to produce the um, any resource that you can gather, actually. And it tells you at the top how much you'll get based on um, what bonuses the city actually has. Like this city, four research or four industry per person. I can produce two influence per person. Or I can produce nine dust per person because I've got... Um, Plus four from the city four, plus three from an empire plan which is in action, and plus two per from my hero who is in there. What was I doing? Yeah, list of city screens, just looking around there, research, showing you that. Quest screen. I mentioned um, side quests earlier, but each faction has their own unique main quest as well. Like this one I've got uh, ten moon leaf, which is a luxury resource from that. And my next goal is to research twelve technologies. I'm currently in the middle of doing that, I've almost got it. And that'll give me an unknown reward. But I've complete, completed this first section of it. Which is, um, they normally ask for the same kind of things, but they do actually change it up a little bit depending on the map. So it's not going to be exactly the same every single time. But yeah, I've got an archaeologist here. Plus 10% cost reduction for A1 technologies on the Empire from doing that. So it, it gave me a research reduction for Tier 1 technologies before it asked me to go and research a whole load of them. So that was pretty nice of it, actually. <laughs> I didn't realise that. Um, moving on. Heroes again. You can have a load of different heroes, but you can only have a certain number of slots. You can also reassign them, but um, they have a cooldown on them before you can assign them again. If you research the tech, you can go into the marketplace and get different heroes. Heroes from different races have different skills and different specialties, like this one. This guy focuses more on food production and flying units, and look at that, that's early on, that's a um, influence booster. So, you can get different heroes, they'll focus on different units, and they'll be better for different times of resource production. So, you can really tailor them to your cities, and it's a good idea to try and get as many of these as you can. There's something else, is these exclusive things here. Exclusive means they're only available to your empire, and then after that they become available to all empires to try and buy. So you can get some unique heroes popping up here every now and then. You can also use the market to get um, mercenary units. And as you can see I can buy different forces like um, I've got a wolf type unit here. I've got those ogres. I've got a, a, an orcish archer kind of thing. Um, that's I think that's a sister. Yeah, that's a sister. Sisters of Mercy faction. A support unit which is seems to be debuff and disease immunity. And it's really good against cavalry. It's got cavalry slayer 4. But yeah, as you can see, you have, to, you have to pay for all these just to get them. Then we've got a Harmonite from the Silix, which is a kind of golem thing. An infantry unit. I've got a Armoured Lizard Rider kind of thing from the Dorgeshi. And then I've got um, a Nydia Flying Bird-like creature, which has um, a circular attack and it's really good against ranged units. And it also has block, so it can reduce the incoming damage as well. So yeah, you can get all sorts of things up here. Though, to be honest, in the marketplace I couldn't actually show you some of the stuff. The marketplace here. Because I've not researched the luxury, strategics, or stockpiles, because you can buy and sell certain amounts of resources, depending on how much dust you've got available and what you're trying to do with it. So yeah, you can trade just about everywhere and all over the place. What else to say? Um, oh yeah, I mentioned earlier, cities expanding. Since this game limits the number of cities you can get, and where you can place them within the individual territories, of course they are the heart of the territories, if they get taken over then you lose the entire territory pretty much. That's nice. But, you can do things like down here. I've expanded this city, so I've got an extra tile here. It's, um... Wait, yeah, it's still the original terrain type under there. It's still got the anomaly on it and everything like that. But it's got access to the hexes around it as well for resources as well. It's uh, cost me a little bit of happiness because they're minus 10 happiness for expanding the city. And it's minus 10 per city you've got as well. So you've got to watch that on the happiness scale. 
but that has given me extra resources, a bit of extra space, and you can really grow your city to access more of the unique tiles, which is built into your entire little place. And if you surround one of these with four of a lower level, then it actually becomes a higher level, as you can see here. It will upgrade to a level two when surrounded by four districts, and that increases how much you get from it. So it, it provides some inherent bonuses and things like that. There's also some structures which require a level two, or higher level districts, so you've got to be aware of that as well. More happiness, more you can expand, more you can grow your cities, the better you do. Really, that's about it. Now, the last thing I want to mention on this is actually the combat system. That is actually quite important, the combat system. We've got some impending battles coming up here, because we've got those guys are probably going to try and take out my settlers. And we've got this force here, which I'm going to try and take out using my little army over here, which is um, three stalwarts, my basic ones. Oh yeah, I forgot. I can't... One something about this faction is that it doesn't automatically heal. I need to use dust to actually do that, so that is a cost of dust for me, if I get hurt. But cities actually have their own garrisons in them. I've got a single militia unit there. And if there's a nearby fight, they get pulled out and drawn into it as well. So if that attacks my city, those guys will get drawn into it, which is rather nice. So let's end the turn there and see what will be seen. Yeah, I'm ready to end turn. Here we go. Please don't go after the settler. Please don't. Just thinking about it. I just hope it doesn't. <laughs> to be honest, I normally auto resolve the battlers in this because the. Oh no, it's moving, it's moving. Yeah, it's trying to take out my settler down there. I thought it would because the settler moved really close to it. Now, as you can see, you've got a global strategy here offensive, defensive, and stuff like that. That's effective in the actual game itself. You can also spectate the fight. You can auto the fight. But given the balance of power here, I don't want to do anything. I actually want to try and retreat. And there we go. My settler escaped with half health. So yeah, fight denied. Thank you. And they've actually backed off a step. <laughs> now, I'm going to try and actually found a city here. They are where I wanted to found the city, to be honest. So I can't do that there. But I can try to do that there, right next to them, so hopefully they'll leave it alone. But, you know, we'll see. Oh, it won't let me go there. Lovely. Can I go to... It, okay, it tried to move through, that's why. Can I move to there? Yes. Can I move to there? No, that actually cost me extra movement because they were next to me, so... That's as far as I'm going to go. I'll build my city right there. My city is built on the Tree of Life. Haha. <laughs> I just hope they don't try and take it over next turn. Now then, where was I? Yes, um, here we go. This roaming army has moved a bit. Because of that. And it's still within range of my troops. I'm going to bring my army hero back in. He may be helping the city, but I want to bring him in just to um, show you. There you go. Heroes added. Hero models being replaced there. He's going to join them, not just as a leader, but actually as an in-battle unit. Which is really good. Now, do I have any upgrades I can apply to him? Yeah, I can actually. I've got tier 1 armor and stuff on there. But I can apply a load of tier 2 upgrades to his equipment. And it does actually change his model a little bit for some of this stuff. Like if I upgrade his shield here, and it should... Yeah, see? It's upgraded the shield. Let's replace his sword. It doesn't do much with the armour upgrade, sadly. Not that I've seen, but it does affect his stats. So that can really change how he works. Uh, weapons and armour, they just add to his basic stats as a combat unit. But artifacts, you can up unlock advanced ones, which require strategic resources. And they give all sorts of different bonuses. So it is really nice. But yeah, equipping you with all this will cost me 117 dust. I've got 143, so that's fine. I can upgrade him. Like that. And now I'm going to move in and actually drop this into an actual proper fight. So let's attack. Here we go. Slightly better in this. They don't have a hero. They've got two units. I've got four units because I've got militia coming in. 
And let's see, global strategy. When when orders cannot be fulfilled, the unit will take an offensive stance by default, a defensive stance by default, or they will just hold position and attack only if an enemy is within range. So yeah, that affects um, what they do. They're semi-autonomous because it's uh, simultaneous turns in this. It's still turn-based, but it's simultaneous turns, pretty much. Because all units actually have an initiative stat. But yeah, I'll leave them on offensive mode and let's get into the fight. Now, this is rather neat. Because it actually uses the uh, campaign map to give you a, a playing field for the fight itself. Cliffs become a factor. Flying units can move around more easily. Flanking and all that stuff. If I had an archery unit up here, they'd be able to rain down on them because there's actually a bonus for being higher up as well. Things like that. And really, you get a movement phase like this. This is the initial deployment. White hexes are his, blue hexes are mine. It doesn't apply left and right like this all the time. It applies at um, all the different angles as, as well. But yeah, this is almost how I want my units to be. But I want this unit down here. So yeah, I'm going to leave them there, and I'm ready to fight. Stop scratching yourself, thank you. And look, my reinforcements have just joined the battle from one of those two reinforcement points back there. But I've got all my melee units in the way, so that's not going to help much. Now these guys... I want them... Uh, you set each one an individual target. They're a unit they'll try to go up to an attack. What's he got? A beam. Override's default attack... Um, attacks enemies behind the initial target up to three tiles, so that if that guy attacked that one, if I had units there and there, it would hurt them as well, so that's pretty nice. Uh, stun. It stuns the units for two rounds if it uh, manages to trigger that, so that's rather nasty. But the problem is they are actually infantry, and my default units are infantry slayers, which is plus 20% damage to infantry. They're also fast, so they can move further in battle. Soul Leech recovers 20% life when a target attacked in this round dies before the end of the round. Rather nice. And so, uh, yeah, status effects. Forest presence. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just going to try and focus these guys down, so that's fine for me. I'll just launch it. And as you can see, they just start going depending on what their initiative is. The hero I just raided is the highest initiative, so he went first. And yes, the units do counter-attack. My hero took a bit of a battering, but the enemy took more. And now my units are just trying to close in and surround this nice little ogre. I think it's only one counter-attack per unit, though, to be honest. And these guys aren't actually doing that much, only 16 damage each. But because we're against these big, massive units, a single unit with 188 hit points, well, I've got these squads trying to attack them. Oh, look, they can't attack because there's a cliff there. Such a shame. <laughs> I'm going to leave that formation in place and just keep attacking like that. Oh, he goes first. Oh, dear, 0 and 83. Yeah, that guy's going to die really, really quick. 16, one more hit should kill him. Yep, there we go, he's dead. Haha, -ha, you're dead. And oh, look. These units just got health back because of the... Um, I don't have any ranged units, so that's going to be a problem, that cliff there. So I can tell my units to move, and then they'll attack. Move to there, you move to there. Hmm. I'm just trying to get a surround on this guy. Yeah, this is what it means with the offensive-defensive stances. They'll try to move... They can't move through each other too well. I don't think they can move through this ogre. You can see where he can move. He can only move one tile. He's not very quick at all. But that's because he's got forests all around him at the moment. But, um, yeah, if they're told to attack, they'll try to move to a position to do so. And that's even after he's moved, so that they'll react to what the enemy does. And um, you can tell them to move, and then if they've got movement left, they'll move and try to attack something else if you've left them on offensive st stances. So here we go. This is what I mean by simultaneous turns. You both give your orders and then you hope for the best. You've got to try and predict what the enemy will do. I predict he's not going to do much at all. Oh, but he's coming round the back. <laughs> 
yeah, you've got to try and predict. But if you've got the enemy's got cavalry or flyers, it can be really good to do so. So you need some ranged units as well. Melee units alone is not going to get you very far in this game. Yeah, I'm putting this around now. He's just being worn down all over the place. One more turn should finish him. Yep, there he goes. Falls at my feet. And that is the victory in this fight. It cycles through the rest to see if there's anything else going on. There isn't. So then the units just all wander back into the army. And it gives you the results screen. And that is a basic fight in this game. A bit ponderous, but it's, it's got some nice little tricks on it. Could probably be worked out quite nicely. <laughs> and and uh, I think I've babbled enough for the time being, so I'll wrap things up here. That's been an episode of What You're Doing. This is Endless Legend. And I'll see you all some other time. Goodbye.